Okay, I am here with Dick Nelms. Dick, can you tell us your age, summary, summary of your experience in World War II, what plane you flew, how many missions, and then what was your crew position? Okay, I am uh, 99 years old, a former B-17 pilot with the 710th Squadron, 447th Bomb Group, and the 8th Air Force, based in England during World War II. In 1944, I flew 35 combat missions into Germany and, and Nazi-occupied territory. Our plane was called Pandora's Box. I went through, actually went through three airplanes where they would be damaged and patching wasn't good enough, so they'd bring in a new one and flew with two crews. And as far as I know, I am the only living member of those two crews. Wow. Questions yeah, could are... you just describe a typical mission? Oh, okay. I volunteered, became an aviation cadet, got my wings and was assigned to the B-17 bomber. At 21, I was overseas, lying in the Quonset hut with my crew. And, uh, the door would fly open, the light would come on, sometimes at three in the morning, and there would stand the CQ, the charge of quarters, shouting at us, up and at them, fly boys, rise and shine, off your back and out of the sack, and, <laughs> and things like that. And our, our bombardier one day threw his shoe at him. It wasn't uh, trying to hit him, it just went skidding across the floor. And uh, he, as he went, as he walked out, he says, "I hope your accuracy improves somewhat later today." <laughs> <laughs> it was always a joke. We always kept our uh, humor going. And then we'd have early breakfast, go to briefing, where we'd be told where we were going, why, generally, uh, what kind of bombs we'd be carrying the weather forecast, and the position each one of us would be flying in an 18 aircraft formation. We usually flew 18 aircraft in three squadrons of six each, would be the lead squadron, the high and the low. Always in the daytime, always in formation, and always bombing targets that kept Hitler waging war. Just anything that would, factories, oil refineries, everything that would be helping him. <clears throat> then we would uh, go to um, our aircraft, start up the engines, check them out, give the crew the signal to pull the chocks out in front of the wheels, release the brakes and taxi out to the takeoff runway, where, where the lead aircraft would be all set, waiting for a signal from the tower. When that came, he would take off and we would follow about every 15 or 20 seconds and form in our designated spots in that formation. If the target was in Germany, we would head out over the North Sea and usually uh, have our bombing altitude of probably 25,000 feet by the time we reached the Netherlands. Before D-Day, this was occupied. And as we cross the coast, we generally get some anti-aircraft fire. Mm. It's generally sparse and not too accurate, but it was kind of a precursor of what we were going to see later on. Yeah. And uh, the uh, lead navigator would have spots marked in his, on his chart called charted flak. And it would be uh, where anti-aircraft fire had been previously reported. So he's, it's up to him to guide us past these spots. And uh, before I go any further, the, the flak word came from the German, Flieser aber Kanon, meaning anti-aircraft cannon. Some clever guy got F-L-A-K out of that. <laughs> and, and the word flak became yeah. a, a, a very nice new word. In yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was everything to us. The, gun were, the guns were flak guns, the shells were flak. The explosion was flak, everything <laughs> like that. So here we are on our way to a target. And uh, the point we're aiming at is called the IP, the initial point. We know when we arrive because the lead aircraft with the lead squadron turns. And for the first time, we're aiming at the target. We don't want the Germans to know 
where we're going until the very last minute. And the bomb bay doors would open. So here we are on what they call the bomb run. The lead bombardier now, uh, oh, I didn't mention that the lead aircraft is on autopilot. And as we start down the bomb run, he switches the control of the autopilot to the northern bomb site that the, his lead bombardier is going to be using. So when he makes a correction, usually it's the course correction on the vertical crosshair. So it's maybe the wind drift is pushing him off a little bit, so he has to make a correction. The, the auto control is connected now to the bomb site, and as he turns his wheel, the, the airplane will turn and follow and pick up that corrected heading. Oh, I see. And, and uh, so here we go down the bomb run, everybody's flying nice, smooth, the sun is shining, <laughs> and, and uh, the air is smooth. Suddenly, you have black puffs of smoke appearing uh -huh. all over. You don't know where they're going to appear. When one's close and you throw, you fly through the concussion, your aircraft bounces around and you hear pieces of steel tearing holes into the aluminum skin of your airplane. Uh, not a very nice sound. Yeah. And uh, they, the Nazis are firing 88 and 105 millimeter cannon and four and six gun batteries from down below. They know that their shells are going to ascend approximately a thousand feet a second, as far as high as 35,000 feet. And if their rangefinders find that our altitude is at 25,000 feet, they set their fuses to explode in 25 seconds. Mm. So, <laughs> then we're here, 18 aircraft. Where will we be in 25 seconds after they fire? So that, that's the aiming point in the sky, so we have that convergence. And, and they would come very close, sometimes too close. Now, would you guys take any evasive action during this point? No, uh, because the bombardier is sighting on the target. Yeah. If he loses that, because we're getting close now, or, or the anti-aircraft wouldn't be firing at us. Yeah. And if he loses that, what do we do? A 360 and do it all over again. Yeah. And that, that you know, so you can't, you can't change uh, altitude, speed, direction, or anything. It's, we're locked in. And, and that's, that's one of, one of the difficulties, really. Because you're, you're starting to get a little worried, a little scared. And uh, I found that handling fear was, was very important, especially the pilots. And I, I would try to concentrate on my training, keep soft hands onto the controls, and keep my position in, in the formation. And we're flying formation, you know, it's, it's kind of tough when you're getting shot at. Yeah. But uh, the uh, thing that uh, and that I would try to do, <clears throat> well, I'll give an example. We had a shell burst that couldn't have been more than 50 feet in front of us, and probably an 88. We went through the concussion. Here again, black pieces bouncing around, put holes in the plexiglass nose. Your brain has become your enemy. It says, if that had gone off a second later, you'd be on your way down. This may be the day you don't go home. All of these fearful things. I said, isn't it great it went off when it did? Everything is okay. <laughs> They're both true. Yeah. Which one's going to keep you under control, see? Yeah. And, and uh, I would always try to do that. I'd always try to find something good. Uh, I, I remember occasion where uh, the, the flak was coming up from a four gun battery and it and it was explosion, 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 and the next one was gonna be right where we are. Didn't go off. <laughs> and, and and back then I heard that the munitions factories and other factories were being manned by slave labor from the countries that they conquered. And and that they would they would mess them up. They would make so the fuses would not explode sometimes. And I think that saved our lives. <laughs> oh. Yeah. 
And and anyway, uh, here we are on the bomb run, and uh, all of the, all of the bombardiers are sitting there waiting for the bombs to come out of the lead aircraft. When the time comes, out they come. The lead bombardier has sighted on the target with his crosshairs, and he's got it coordinated now, so there's no movement. It, it goes right with the target. And he's put information into that bomb site, like the bombs we were carrying, the speed we're going, the altitude, and and uh, any wind drift that he's knowledgeable about. And out they come. He shouts bombs away over the radio. Up till now, no radio uh, noise was ever uh, was was done. Nobody can talk. So he shouts bombs away. The first bomb is, has smoke on coming out of it and and the others have bright ribbons and then and, oh. and, and the other bombardiers when they see that they hit this toggle switch so we have 216 bombs all going down at once on the target and uh, uh, there are times where uh, well like an oil refinery for instance you have your refinery but you have storage tanks all over the place full of gasoline <laughs> and we love to hit oil refiners i know i do you, you can't miss the target yeah you going in with high explosives or incendiaries yeah well that, that's that thank you uh we would generally go on an oil refinery as a combat wing where you have the lead group a second one and a third one all at different altitudes and and few and a few miles apart but they're all going to end up at the same target, one after another. Usually an oil refinery, where the first group would be carrying probably 12, 500 pound general purpose bombs to hit things, start some fires, and just scatter a lot of damage. And, and uh, the second group, and maybe even the third one, would have incendiaries mm -hmm. with uh, thermite and, and magnesium bombs. Thermite, is, as you know, uh, cannot be extinguished. Yeah, you put it under water; it doesn't matter, doesn't make a bit of difference. And uh, they would light that up like a like a torch. And we're five miles up, and and it's hard to to see just what's going on. But when we turn to go back to our head back to our field, uh, you can look down and see our black smoke coming up, <laughs> and it re really a thrill. <laughs> uh, it, it it meant so much. It it meant fewer submarines, fewer tanks, fewer trucks, fewer Luftwaffe coming up and trying to shoot us down. And uh, so so I think the, the oil refineries was was probably my favorite target. One of them um, that I can recall. If someone asked me what was your worst mission, I could say Berlin. Okay. The second time I went to Berlin, I th I think we must have been well. First of all, <clears throat> uh, it was reported that Berlin had over two thousand anti-aircraft guns. Can you imagine that? The area, not just yeah. the city. And all the way up to one twenty eights that were up on towers with with a a, 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 a kind of a escalator system that would take the shells up to the the gunners and they'd show it in there and the 128 is getting to be a pretty good pretty good sized shell and uh, we're heading on down into the bomb run and and you could see up ahead this 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 particular mission was what they call a maximum effort for the visa for the eighth air force uh, I don't know how many groups that would be maybe 40 or so of 18 aircraft each Picking out not all the same targets, but they had quite a few around the Berlin area that was supporting Hitler. Yeah, and uh, we started on down, and I didn't know the difference, but we were probably in the jet stream. At that time, we didn't even know what that would have been, and because we were in constant anti-aircraft fire for almost a half hour. Wow, and that that's devastating. I knew we were getting hit a lot. The airplane, you could hear it coming through the plane and, and almost constant turbulence from the shells bursting. I like going into a different dimension, different world. 
Was that particular mission before D-Day or after D-Day? Oh, remember? after. After D-Day, yeah. okay. Yeah. And um, speaking of D-Day, I want to come back. To yeah, that. all right. <laughs> and and uh, we uh, got home okay, obviously, and, and uh, landed okay. Everything seemed fine. And I think it was the radio man said, let's count the holes. Uh -huh. I, I'm sure we, we got a lot of holes. We started counting and got tired of counting at 300 holes in that airplane. Wow. <laughs> Didn't even get underneath. <laughs> it must have been around 400. Nothing vital had been hit on the airplane. It flew just as well as it did when I took off. And uh, none of the crew had been hurt. It was it was quite a deal. But the first report was that we lost 68 bombers. Wow. And that would include B-24s also. Then it went to 28 for publication. And I think it ended up around 48 B-17s, you know. It just, yeah. Uh, rumors and so forth were flying all over the place. Now, now you mentioned flak. What was the threat from fighters in comparison to flak? Well, at first, uh, the first group of uh, 8th Air Force guys that went over had to do 25 missions with no fighter escort. And, and, and they would get hit by fighters, superior numbers, just about every mission. Yeah. And uh, then when we got fighter escort, that amount descended and it went to 30 missions that we had to do. When I got over there, it was 30, and then the casualty rate descended even more and went to 35. That's why I did 35 <laughs> missions. But uh, the uh, question you ask now is... is uh, Flak versus fighters. That's right. Yeah. And, and so fighters were the big deal at that time. Yeah. And, and Flak wasn't too bad because uh, Goring had told Hitler that the Luftwaffe would keep the the Eighth Air Force from ever bombing a big city or anything like that, and that, of course that wasn't true. So they they ended up having to fortify those cities much with many more cannon. But when I got over there, uh, not long I I had three fighter attacks and and they weren't too bad. They, we lost one airplane, and uh, we were dissipating their oil and uh, the gasoline. And so instead of coming back and engaging us like they did before, they would just go down and land. They'd have to save fuel. So it was not too bad. And then General Doolittle decided that the fighter escort was nice, but the fighter has to travel faster than we did. We are going at indicated airspeed of 150 to 160, and uh, they can't fly that slowly. <laughs> And so they, not only that, but they can't carry a lot of fuel. So they could probably meet us at the target and, and take us a certain way, but then they'd have to leave and go home. He said, let's go down and strafe these airfields that the Luftwaffe are occupying before they can get up. Yeah. And, and uh, the P-47 has eight 50 caliber machine guns. <laughs> Imagine the damage they would do. Oh, sure. And, and, and you know, here you got uh, ME 109s and FW 190s all over the field. They could come down with those eight and just do that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the P 51 had, had six. Yeah. So that kept the fighter attacks to almost zero. Yeah. And, uh, and those that did come up were generally engaged by our fighters. By that time, uh, our, our fighter forces were being uh, enlarged quite a bit. So you mentioned your airspeed between 150 and 160. That's in miles per hour, yes. the units, yeah. And yeah. that's your indicated airspeed. Yeah. I seldom looked at it. Yeah. You're flying formation. You don't take your eyes off the plane that you're flying off of any more than a second or two. Yeah. I see. And then you mentioned three encounters, uh, uh, more or less three encounters with fighters. Uh, did they attack your particular airplane or just your squadron? Uh, n well, no, they came through, uh, that, that's an interesting thing, they, <clears throat> uh, they were uh, ME-109s, 
or VFW 109s, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But they were the German fighters, and with an inline engine with a pointed nose, like our P-51. So they came over. We didn't have an escort. But when the escort does arrive, they come up here about 500 feet above us or so and have to S back and forth to stay with us. Like I say, they have to go faster than we do. Yeah. And then uh, the ME-109s did that, <laughs> pretending they were P-51s. We knew immediately well, they weren't, and, but they're up there Sing back and forth, back and forth. And we're, we're flying fairly tight. And uh, they went on up ahead. And I wasn't flying at the time. There are two pilots, you know, yeah. in that airplane. And, and uh, I kept an eye on it up ahead, and I started seeing flashes of sunlight reflecting off the things. What they were doing is doing half rolls like that and, and heading right at us head on. And sure enough, here they come. They have a, a 20 millimeter cannon in each wing with tracers. And these these black explosions are going by. Boy, uh, it gets your attention in a hurry, I'll tell you. Uh, and and uh, right through the formation, two at a time, flying together. They took out uh, one of the planes in the lower squadron. And here again, they just disappeared after they did that. And about two dozen of them. And except for one. We're flying along. We were number six in the high squadron. I call them tail end Charlie lots of times. Yeah. And uh, the right waist gunner, ours, said, I think we have a bandit out here looking at us. And sure enough, here was one of the, P the uh, LA 109s sitting out there about a thousand yards. And just going along like that, you know. And he's, I don't know what he's thinking. Maybe I'm going to take out that D-17 and go home a hero or something <laughs> like that. So he starts in in what they call a pursuit curve that has to be the same all the time in order to get into guns bearing position. So that's why our gunners have a little advantage over him. We know exactly where he's going to go. Yeah, very predictable curve. Yeah. yeah. And he's out there, and as he comes in, he st he banks. And and we are we have guns that have a... 600 yard range he has guns that have a 300 yard range because he has a cannon and I guess the recoil keeps it down or something I don't know but anyway he gets right about here and we're, we're firing bursts at him either we got some hits on him or he said maybe I should do this tomorrow <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm making a joke out of it yeah. but it was six, uh, 78 years ago <laughs> and he made a fatal mistake Instead, when he decides not to do it, he should have done that. But he went inverted under us to come down, go down this way. And our right waist gunner said, Art, who's the ball turret underneath. Uh, there's Art right there. Okay. Yeah. And the right waist is here. Oh, I see. Yeah. And he says, Art, seven o'clock low. So Art swung his, his, his turret around, and they were separating, but he was still close enough where he could put two bursts right to the bottom of that airplane. And, uh, and, and here, I'm listening to this, I can't see any of it. You know? And he, uh, he said he went on down, uh, in, inverted, and then righted, and came straight up, and stalled out and went into a spin all the way down. So he figured he shot the, got the pilot, because he said the plane was smoking, but it was not on fire. And uh, the two gunners in number three, see we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And I was six and they were three, so they were ahead of me like that. They're shooting at him too. But Art had the real, dead shot on him yeah so he puts in for a kill they did too they gave art a half a kill and them one quarter each <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that, that's war
But that's the only fighter attack that I can recall that really... Uh, we had some Fock Wolf 190s come over at some one time and did the same thing. And, and we were flying a nice smooth formation and they decided it was too dangerous. So they took off and didn't, didn't come in. Wow. So you mentioned that you actually flew one of your 35 combat missions on D-Day. Yeah. Yeah, what was, what was that like? Well, we expected that it would be very exciting and, and maybe even dangerous. But D-Day was probably the worst day of the year in England. Terrible weather. And what we'd call, they have an overcast down there. We call it an undercast because we're up here. We took off as, as many of the bomb groups did and about 10,000 feet went over the beach. Couldn't see what, what was down below at all. And we had no idea how far our troops had gone, where we were exactly. And we didn't want to go too far and bomb a, a French village. Yeah. We just turned around and took them back, took the bombs back. It, it was just not worth it. But uh, I, I don't know what we could have done. Now, you mentioned D-Day. Yeah. Uh, two days before D-Day, we and other groups were sent to Pas Calais up on the northern coast of France to take out some large caliber coastal guns. And we did. And uh, I, I think the, the damage was, was very successful. And another group did it the next day. And we, we said, yeah, that's, a, that's interesting to spend all that time up there. What we were doing was not only taking out coastal guns, but making Hitler think that's where the Normandy invasion was oh, going to be. I see. <laughs> and he believed it. He sent all kinds of fortifications up there and, and panzer divisions and everything, taking them away from southern France, where the we real in Normandy, yeah. way down in the <laughs> south. And as bad as it was, it could have been a disaster. Yeah. Somebody had a good idea there. And... Uh, that mission, plus one where our troops after D-Day, -Day, a few days, were held down by superior German forces at St. Lo, which was on the coast not far from Normandy, where they were being held down. The Germans had a lot of tanks, guns, more troops, and our troops were really catching it bad and, and just sitting there wanting to go forward into France. We went down, here again, many groups, and bombed with anti-personnel bombs at 10,000 feet, just a mile or two ahead of our own lines, into the Germans. And two days of that went twice. We almost completely wiped them out. And it allowed our troops to continue advancing with a little bit of resistance, but nothing like it would have been. No, I see. The German general was quoted as saying, here again, what you hear, you know, yeah. could it, it might not have been true. He was quoted as saying, I have no more cannon, no more tanks, no more troops, all is lost. <laughs> and, and he was pretty correct. If you like to that. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. So we did not get fired upon. And I think that because they had all 88 millimeter cannon, that were a great cannon, and, and, but they had percussion caps on them. And that not, not fuses, that not time fuses. So if he, they fired at us and missed, 99% yeah. they did. All their damage was usually an explosion nearby where the slack would come in. Yeah that's going to come back down and bomb them. <laughs> so they did not shoot that. <laughs> they figured that one out. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So how, how long did your typical missions last to, say, Berlin? Was it measured in, in miles there and back, or did you usually say it's a you know eight-hour mission or 10-hour mission? How, how would you measure the, the mission duration? We, uh, air crews, measured it in time. Okay. <clears throat> I think maybe the 
the, the ground personnel and her superior officers figured, figured the distance, I don't know. Yeah. But it was all time. And not only that, see, it would, it would be time in the air for us too, we put on our, on our log sheets. You know? Oh, I see. And uh, yeah, the, the shortest were around four hours before D-Day when we could go over to France and, and bomb an occupied air, air field or something like that. The longest was almost 11 hours and that was to Munich. Munich. And uh, I, I joke about Munich. I tell people we bombed the, the, the Bavarian Auto Works. They figured that out, BMW, oh, yeah. <laughs> Motor Works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they weren't making automobiles at that time. <laughs> oh. And then as a, as a crew member, the flight engineers, what, what were his, so he stood behind you guys and operated the upper turret. What, what was his duties to support the pilot and co-pilot during, during a typical mission? Well, uh, if something like the uh, landing gear didn't want to come down, it was up to him to get out there on the bomb bay and crank it down. Little things like that, he'd try, he, he's supposed to know how to do it and take care of. The, the important thing I felt was that he knew how to transfer fuel from one tank to, to others. Because we, we had 1,400 gallons of gas in each wing. And on a, long, on a longer mission, there'd be two 400-gallon tanks in the bomb bay, so that's 3,600 gallons of 119 gas, 119 gasoline. But they, they, they don't just go into an engine like the automobile. Uh, this, this one would, would go into a number one and a number two, and then number three and four would be different and so forth. Yeah, like dedicated tanks and feeder tanks. Yeah. Yeah. And he and, and they would all not they would not burn the fuel at the same rate or something, and it would be up to him to transfer. He had a way of transferring and, and equalizing the fuel that goes into the engines, and he'd have to do that. Would he also help in like calling out airspeed or altitude or or other parameters? No, he pretty well stayed in his turret. Okay. Yeah, it might have had some crews on ours. He didn't because we had the two pilots. Yeah. And, and uh, if, the, if, if the first pilot is flying, the co-pilot will, t will sometimes tell him out. The, the, the manifold, manifold pressure on number two is getting a little bit strange, you know. We'll keep an eye on it or something like that. Yeah. And, and it's uh, uh, airspeed. He'd call out airspeed on landing. I see. And, and take care of dropping the wheels and, and, uh, and flaps and things, you know. Yeah. And when you guys released the ordnance, the bombs, did the plane did the plane react to that? Yeah, it really did, especially on a salvo where everything comes out at once. They have the two ways of dropping. One's a train, where uh, maybe about every half second one comes out, so they come yeah. out, come out like that. And and when they do, the airplane will will be going up lighter and lighter and, and just <laughs> going up like that, and you'd have to hold it down. But a salvo, it would be playing one on just rise, because you're, you're dropping six thousand pounds out of that airplane just like that. Yeah, and we, we'd be expecting it. We, it, would, uh, it wouldn't take long to get used to that. But all you had to do was reach down and, and retrim the elevators, <clears throat> so you'd be in, in in correct balance again. Yeah, I see. Okay, and then and then during the mission, was there much chatter on the intercom? Uh, absolutely none. Okay. The only chatter would be if somebody was in trouble, or if he saw something that we all ought to know about, like an enemy aircraft out there. Or, uh, and the only talk that came to us until we got to the target from the lead aircraft was gunners test your guns. We get out over the North Sea, all the gunners are supposed to aim, aim down at the sea or somewhere and make sure that they put the gun to, uh, together correctly so, so they would go die, you know, yeah. just, just to give a burst. And uh, over the target, on, on the bomb run, the lead aircraft would, would call and say, rainy day, rainy day, which meant 
that the radio men would start throwing bundles of chaff out their little window. And chaff is, is like the tinfoil you used to put on a Christmas tree. Yeah. And all in bundles. And it would explode, they would explode when they hit the air and, and go on down and mess up the Germans' radar. Oh, I see. And, and uh, we don't know, it must have had a good effect, but uh, their accuracy was, was accurate anyway. Yeah. Did, um, did you ever lose any crew members? And if so, what, what were the circumstances to that? Our uh, uh, tail gunner lost his life. And it was a very strange situation. On our very first mission, <clears throat> they, they, they would take a new crew like us and not send us out uh, green on the first mission. Like we, They would take different crew members and put them on veteran aircraft replacing that same position. And, and, and in this case, our the tail gunner was on another airplane. When the, when the voice came over, gunners test your guns, one of the gunners carelessly shot into the wing oh. of the plane that he was on. Now we're using armor-piercing incendiary 50 caliber machine guns. The wing caught on fire, 1,400 gallons of gas. On a wing fire, you bail out. It's gonna burn a little while and then it's either gonna drop off or explode, and then your plane is gonna be in a spin and you cannot get out then. So, the signal came, the, 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 he, he rang the bell three times, the, the, the pilot, and, and also said bail out, bail out, bail out. The tail gunner's riding backwards, he can't see any of this, and all of a sudden he hears a bail out, bail out, and, the, and he looks around and he sees the fire on the, right, on the wing out there. Now, it was such a surprise, maybe he panicked, we don't know. First mission, understand. And he has a, a there's a plate on, on, on the side of the tail with a rope, and he pulls that rope and that plate falls off and he can just roll out and bail out so easily. He did that. Now, whether or not he had his parachute on, nobody knows. Mm. The other thing would be that we had a lecture talking about how to bail out over enemy territory. If we're at 25,000 feet, free fall 24,700 feet <laughs> before you pull your ripcord. That's to keep the enemy from seeing you. Yeah. And you have 300 feet for the for the, for the uh, parachute to take hold, and it, and it does. See, see, leaves on the trees before you pull it, in other words. And we thought maybe he did that. But over water, you really can't tell how high you are yeah, off the water. Yeah, difficult to judge. So he, he, he evidently went right into the sea. They never, the air sea rescue boats going, going up and down, picked up all nine guys, couldn't find him. And, uh, it, yeah. was, it was a sad thing. You mentioned the uh, ammo that they used were armor-piercing incendiary rounds. Was that was that a hundred percent armor-piercing incendiary, or were there tracers and other types of um, cartridges in that mix? Do you do you recall? Yeah, uh, as far as when I was over there, they were all armor all APIs. Originally, they had tracers. And, and, and you know better than I which one was a tracer every, what, every about, about every fifth round, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and of course the tracer is a smoke and you can follow it. But aerial gunnery, it didn't work very well because you're on a moving platform like the waste gunner. We're, let's say we're going 150 airspeed up there, maybe 200. And his gun is going with the airplane. Here comes a fighter, and even though when he fires, those shells go off faster than Mach 2, that shell is going to go a little bit off because it's moving with the airplane, the, the projectile. Yeah. And, and uh, so it, it makes gunnery much, much more difficult. 
and uh, so it, it uh, I, don't, I don't know where I was leading here. <laughs> but just on trace, the, yeah, the on tracers, tracer. the optical distortion that yeah. occurs. At, That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did not use tracers at all. And uh, as far as putting regular ammo in, I don't think they did. I think yeah. it was always army piercing incendiaries. Yeah. That's that's yeah. That sounds about right. And then um, when you flew, did you did you carry a sidearm? Did your um, and then the rest of the officers, or did everybody carry a sidearm, or what was the? Uh, we had four officers: the bombardier, navigator, and the pilot and co-pilot. <clears throat> And we each carried a, a, a 45 caliber Colt revolver, uh, automatic. Automatic, okay, yeah. And uh, had a shoulder holster, which was quite comfortable, and the gun was sitting right here. And we were told that if we had to bail out over enemy territory, and the uh, soldiers saw us, the, the, not the German soldiers came rushing at us, pull out the gun and let them see you throw it. If it's peasants, be prepared to shoot them because they want to pitchfork you. Yeah. They thought that we were, that we had started the war and that Hitler was the god, you know. And uh, they they would kill they would kill us. The the uh, the, the six uh, en enlisted men did not have the fire the sidearms. I don't know why, but they just didn't. Oh, interesting. Yeah. One of my worst missions, I had two, I mentioned Berlin. The other was quite different. Here we are in an 18 aircraft group. I was in the low squadron this day. They, they would change us around. It didn't matter how well you could fly or anything. Yeah. And I was flying in number five in the low squadron. A good friend of mine was flying number two so here again, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So five and two are like this, flying along. He gets a direct hit in his left wing root, tore most of the wing off. All the gas exploded. Things will, buy, will, will burn at 25,000 feet, <laughs> believe me, I saw it happen. And an engine went sailing by my canopy. This whole thing took about two or three seconds. It sounds like it goes on and on. And he and the two right engines were still operating. See, it this explosion probably killed him. It was right next to his spot in the, in the airplane. And the, the plane went into a roll and it spin at the same time. It was like a corkscrew sort of thing down on top of me and see he stopped flying it, he was flying and all of a sudden he's not flying for maybe only going 50 miles an hour yeah. and here I am underneath him and he, he, he was doing this and I pulled back and that wonderful B-17 wing it was so big it, it was slow but boy oh boy it was responsive I pulled back and bango up we went and just missed him I expected to hear him scraping on the bottom. <laughs> the ball turret gunner was looking backwards, <laughs> thank goodness he saw that plane. And he, he, he did yell, what was that? And I said, that was Jim. And he, he watched them and, and uh, they went all the way down. Nobody got out as far as he could see. I had breakfast with him that morning. We were, we were friends. Oh, and, wow. And, and I consider that pretty much one of my worst missions. The opposition of the mission was standard, nothing really big happened. And, and I want to say a couple of things on fear. Yeah. Uh, when we took off, even on what we call the milk run that would go to France and back before D-Day, uh, you always have that little bit of apprehension of not being sure you're going to come back. That's always there. That's part of the job. Always a little fear, a lot of excitement. I would always get a thrill pushing those throttles forward and feeling that acceleration and knowing them. And then all of a sudden you're 
you're free of the earth, you know. Yeah. And um, but the uh, the main thing was to be able to uh, to keep from getting into what I call the white knuckle mode, you know. Yeah. And uh, some guys did that. And, and, and it endangers the, their, his own crew. They become much less important to the mission itself. And it's not what he's supposed to do. Yeah. One time, we went to Leipzig to take out some a Messerschmitt, Messerschmitt uh, aircraft assembly plant on the edge of Leipzig, Germany. Headed on down the bomb run, and instead of having the shells coming up like that, kind of running into him, the first of all, he was right underneath my airplane. And it scared me. It was, un it was unexpected, violent, and it actually bounced us a little like that. And here again, my brain said, gee, uh, another 50th of a second. That shell's going up so fast. Yeah. That another 50th of a second had been inside the airplane blowing us all to pieces. Think that, that close, and and uh, it, it scared me, and and I had had trouble shaking it. I tried to think all the nice, positive things, to a point where I got embarrassed and and, and kind of ashamed of myself. It was about ten seconds of, of fear. And I finally started talking to myself, and my oxygen mask. Nobody heard me. <laughs> I said, "Stop it! Stop it!" Cut this stuff out. You're up here to prove you you, you can do this sort of operation, and, and, and you, you just can't allow this stuff to happen. Now I cut it out. I swore at myself a couple of times. <clears throat> I had I had uh, become angry, which was which was good. And uh, the fear dropped away when I became angry. Just then the shells started coming up normally, bursting. When I'm about maybe a hundred feet at seven o'clock, a little higher than uh, than us, went through the concussion, and here again that sickening sound of, of it coming through the plane. I leaned over and said, "You missed me," <laughs> <laughs> and and I knew that shouting into my oxygen mask wasn't going to shorten the war, <laughs> but you get tired of feeling like a clay pigeon up there. Yeah. Being shot at by a carnival shooting gallery, you know? <laughs> and uh, you had you had no defense. You're, you're you're locked in and just hoping that none of those shells hit you. It, it's it's a Russian roulette in its worst way. Yeah. But uh, you just had to say uh, that. Uh, well, a chaplain stopped me once when I came back to the barracks and he said how'd it go today and I said oh not not too bad he said think about this I, I, I it came to me the other day <clears throat> when you're up there you have no control of where those shells are going to burst up there but you do have control of what's going on up here and that helped me and and, and then I, he said a few other things like uh, uh, being being fearful is is kind of productive it can't protect you. And of course, he was a chaplain, and he mentioned God a few times. But, uh, and and that uh, that that was pretty well the answer, you know. And and uh, uh, we we had a pilot, for instance, that uh, I didn't know him. It was from another squadron, but I heard about it. Where. I knew his co-pilot, and his co-pilot was telling me that he was worried about him because he seemed like he was getting too scared. And, and as soon as they would take off, he would start getting worried mm. over England. And, yeah. And uh, when they would get over the target, he'd start shaking and, and let the co-pilot fly. And uh, finally, they they got a hit on number three engine, and it caught and it caught on fire. The co-pilot reached up and pressed number three fire extinguisher while the pilot is yelling over the radio, bail out, bail out. Bail out. And the co-pilot knocked his hand off the button 
once someone has that hand on the button talking, you, nobody can interfere. They can't talk louder. He's got it. So he knocked his hand off and he said, stay with me. We're, we're going to be okay. Stay with me. The fire went out on the engine. Of course, they had to, to feather the propeller to keep yeah. it from windmilling. And uh, it was no good anymore. They shut the engine off. So they, they went down on the deck, maybe three to 500 feet, flew safely home on three engines. He, he, the co-pilot did. Meanwhile, the pilot is crying most of the time, realizing oh. that he had, what he had done. We, we right away wanted to think of him as a coward. And I, I, finally it came to me, no. If he was a coward, he would have let go of everything and jumped himself. Yeah. But he was thinking of the crew, telling him that them to bail out. It was just 180 degrees wrong. Yeah. Because he let the let fear keep him from thinking. Yeah. And then we mentioned ammo before. Did you guys? Was it a policy to carry extra ammo on the airplane in like crates or anything, or, or did you do you, do you recall if um, if you guys carried any extra ammo? No, I think the that the uh, original guys that we got over there and they had a lot of fighter attacks were trying to do that. But but it's dangerous. It, it weighs the airplane down more than it should. Yeah. And uh, we, we did not do it at all. The, the idea of firing was to go off about a one second burst. One, da 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 let go. Like that. For, for two reasons. You can recite and the, the the barrel is not going to melt. Yeah, <laughs> and it it would. Yeah, uh, not on our group. They 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 had a belt a, a barrel that uh, turned red hot and a shell went right out the side of it. Oh, ouch! The 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 gunner just panicked. Yeah, yeah, I got a cook off right. Yeah, yeah. not 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 good. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, it, it would be, uh, you know, we, we were called heroes. We, we didn't feel that way at all. The hero would be the guy that would, would, would run back and save the life of another crew member or something like that. But, yeah. but we were in our positions and we were supposed to uh, perform the way we were supposed to. And, and sure, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to be a, a skyscraper window washer. You know? yeah. the, the danger goes with the job, and, and, uh, and that's the way we figured it. And, and we felt privileged to be up in the air and, and doing such an important thing where the poor guys on the ground, they weren't even sure they were going to be eating. They couldn't take a shower or anything like that. <laughs> when we'd get home, we'd go to debriefing where they'd ask us about the mission. And uh, by, by the uh, intelligence people. And, and what I'm gonna get at is that uh, after we went through debriefing, we'd be hungry. We hadn't eaten for maybe 10 or 13 hours. You yeah. know, <laughs> and and uh, wanna go down to the mess hall and eat? No, 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 not yet. The group required you to change clothes, dress in your class A uniform with the tie, the shirt, the tunic, the everything. And then you could go down and have dinner or late lunch. We thought that was kind of rude, you know. <laughs> but w what happens was, if you're gonna do that, what you're doing is kicking off your combat clothes, taking a shower, dressing up like a human being you're no longer a warrior, and you've, and it, it really a different mindset. It, you know? it really yeah. did shed a lot of the fear and and and, and the stress of, of what you'd been through. Yeah, and, and I think that's partly responsible why I can sit here and tell you these things without trembling. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of the Eighth Air Force casualties. In the three years that they were over there, they lost almost 30,000 crew members killed. Imagine that. Yeah. I've heard 28, I've heard 29, I've read 30. And, uh, and another 50,000 
either wounded or taken prisoner of war. And, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a big deal. Thousands of us were over there flying and bombing and, and, and uh, thousands of us got back, like me. Pretty proud of the irreparable damage we had done to Hitler's war machine. <laughs> <laughs> so, I enjoyed talking with you. Okay, hey, thanks, Dick. All right.